Yeah, welcome to the second webinar for 10 standard students of higher level English in Maharashtra. Over to the convener of this webinar, Renu Dhotra, teacher from Mumbai. Over to you, Renu, ma'am. Good evening and welcome everyone, dear students, teachers and speakers of the day and the speaker of the day, Ms. Renita. Augustine. Dear students, I feel privileged to announce Learn From Home webinar series for a higher level English medium school organized by MNET with the technical support of INET Connect, featuring speakers like Dr. Manjushri Sardesh Pandey, the chairperson of the Board of Studies Balbarti Pune, Mr. Nadeem Khan, academic coordinator of Chess Ra Aurangabad, and Board of Studies member Balbarti Pune. Mr. Avinash Rade, Board of Studies member, Balpati Pune, Ms. Renita Augustin, State Resource Person of Chess Ra Aurangabad, Mrs. Vinita Nair, Resource Person of English New Syllabus and author of several academic and non-academic books, Mrs. Sylvia Francis, State Resource Person of Chess Ra Aurangabad. Learn from Home webinar series starts from 4th of August, started from 4th of August, 2020, and it will continue till 21st of August daily, except Wednesdays and Sundays. And it will be uh, broadcasted at 6 p.m. Uh, this series will provide a wonderful platform to know and understand your English activity sheet. I request all our participants to be a part of the series that would guide you to deal with your activity sheet according to the state board norms and criteria. The speaker of the day is Ms. Renita Stephen Augustine, and she's teaching in Holy Cross Convent High School, Akola, since 15 years. She's teaching subjects like English and Social Studies for class 9 and 10. She's a recipient of District Best Teacher Award 2019-2020. She has worked, worked as a resource person with Yashida for English working for English. Uh, she's working as a state resource person for Chess Ra Aurangabad. She's also working as a, in the writing committee as a member of Chess Ra Aurangabad. She's worked as a resource person for revised syllabus training program. She's a member of the planning committee of English online project run by the State Institute of English for Maharashtra Aurangabad. She's, uh, she's going to deal with question number one, A and B. Uh, this is in continuation with the uh, uh, question number one, A and B, that is language study. We'll complete uh, this today, the first question. So if you have any queries or doubts, you can put it in the chat box or comment se se uh, section. Um, so that the, your questions can be dealt in these, in these incoming days. I request all the students who are on the YouTube channel to behave yourself. Do not use abusive language. Do not write comments which are not appropriate. Uh, if we find out that you are not with your name or you are writing comments which are not appropriate, you will be removed from the, from the channel. Uh, thank you. And without wasting much time, I ask Mrs. Renita Augustine to begin her session. Thank you, Renu, ma'am, once again for the beautiful introduction. Thank you so much. Without wasting time, let's move. Uh, I'll share my screen. Yes. Yeah, ma'am. Is it clear? Yeah, it's it's not full screen. Yeah, one minute. Sure. Yeah, is it okay? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so a warm welcome to all, all the teachers who are here and all our dear students. A warm welcome to all of you for this next session of uh, English Activity Sheet. It's the continuation of your question number one, language study. So uh, in our last session, which we had, we were discussing about, uh, we discussed already about simple activities. And also we had already started with medium activities where we decided and discussed homograph, homonyms, 
homophones, as well as uh, tenses and word register. So today we are going to move forward to next two topic that is direct and indirect narration as well as conversion of tenses. So, sorry, it, it's uh, change the voice. So let's begin with change the voice. Now, uh, change the voice to, it comes for two marks in your medium activities. Now, when it comes for two marks, uh, there is a great scope for all of us to score here because uh, the way how it is placed in the exam, I'll be talking about it, but little bit of base, which I want to give you basic rules, which we need to know about. Now let's talk about voice. When we talk about voice, we know that it's a form of verb that uh, indicates that whether the subject is doing the action or whether some action has been done on the subject. So depending on this, we know very well that we have two types of voice active voice and passive voice. Now, in very simple manner, I have placed in front of you that what when a sentence is called as active voice, when a subject does any action, so that time we say that it's active voice. Like take example, the, the police chased the thief, the subject, the police, it's doing action of chasing. So it's an active voice and the next is a passive voice. So when subject receives any action, we call that particular sentence to be in passive voice. Like take the same sentence, see how it is shifted. The thief was chased by the police. So now here, the subject is receiving the action of chasing. And you can see even how the replacement of subject and object is done. So we can say that this is in passive voice. Now let's take some simple and basic tips. How can we change a sentence from active to passive? There are certain uh, simple basic rules. Like, first of all, you need to interchange position of subject and object. As you can see here that how uh, subject and object has been replaced here. Object has come to subject's place. Subject has come to object place. Then you need to add some to be form of tenses or in simple way, I can say some auxiliary verbs like auxiliary verbs like am, is, are, was, were, will be, or has, have, had, been, will have been, am, is, was, being. So in simple way, I would say that auxiliary verbs you have to add or helping verbs. Then you need to add past participle if required. And finally, add preposition by. And when you change from passive to active, you just need to reverse the procedure, like remove your preposition by, if uh, it's needed, then remove your past participle, remove your auxiliaries. It's not necessary every time you need uh, to remove auxiliaries, but in some cases you need to remove your auxiliaries. And again, you need to interchange the position of subject and object. So this is a simple way to remember that how you have to change your sentence from active to passive or vice versa. So now how it's going to come in your exam for two marks, that means it's very important to score. So they will either give you subject or object. So if you can see here in a small dialogue box, I have put one example that I am taking a big chance. So here they will give you that rewrite or begin the sentence with a big chance. That means they'll give you object, okay? So in this way, they are going to place it to you in your exam. They, they will not directly say that change the voice. Either subject or object will be given to you. There are some more points which you can add into it, like which I want you to recall that change the voice is always possible when there is a transitive verb. That means when a verb's action passes from subject to object. If there is no transitive verb, so you cannot ex expect that you can change the voice. Then second basic rule which you have to remember that when a question comes in for your change the voice, you need to change the voice in a question form. Like example, why do we eat food? So the way how you are supposed to write it, why is food eaten by me? So you have to remember that when a question comes for change the voice, you have to change it in the same manner. The next part is, the, if the statement is negative, then do remember that even your change the voice should be negative. Like example, I did not like him. So he was not liked by me. So can you see that the nature of sentence is not changed? We have kept it same. Then next is, 
if two objects are there in a sentence then start your change the voice with first object always do remember we have direct object and we have indirect object in a sentence if it comes then start with your first object it's very simple to remember first object so tom gave the teacher an apple so you have two objects here the teacher and apple right so you need to take your first object here so first object is your teacher so start your change the voice with the teacher so the teacher was given an apple by tom and now very important rule particularly when change the voice comes in imperative sentence form imperative means order and request right so whenever you have imperative transitive sentence okay when the verb is transitive and the sentence is sentence is imperative you should start your change the voice with let like give me uh, let me give you one example open the door okay so open is your transitive verb because action is passing to the door so you have to start with let let the door be opened and if you have your intransitive imperative sentence then you should begin your change the voice with you are like let's take one more example a simple example sit down okay so sit down action is not passing to any object so you come to know that this is an imperative sentence and it is intransitive so you should start with you are you are ordered to sit down or you are requested to sit down and the last part of uh, your change the voices if you have a negative imperative sentence like take example uh, don't shut the door okay so you have to use not to so you can start you are ordered not to shut the door or you are requested not to shut the door so these are some basic steps which you can use and you can uh, change your voice and you can earn your two marks okay so the next topic for today is our reported speech now uh, whenever we think about reported speech we get too afraid about reported speech like we get afraid we feel that uh, this is a very tricky and uh, you know a difficult type of a subject but it's very easy a uh, easy topic now let us first clear about reported speech now you know that it's also called as your direct speech and indirect speech let's first understand that what is direct speech and what is indirect speech now you have two examples in front of you okay one example you have uh, a conversation between a boy and a girl on friday night and the boy says that i will call you tomorrow right after two three days the same girl she is telling to her friend that he he said that he would call me the next day see how the sentence is the first day the sentence was the boy said he said i will call you tomorrow and when after 2 3 days the same girl was speaking to the third person so she uh, changed you can say that particular quoted words of the boy saying he said that he would call me the next day so it's very clear that when words are directly quoted okay so in this particular thing you can see that words are directly quoted so that is your direct speech and when words are quoted indirectly then it is called as to be in indirect speech now can you see that there is a shift of or change of so many things here like see you can see that the subject has changed i it has changed that means your pronoun has changed okay then your verb has changed your tenses have changed and even some words like your tomorrow has changed to the next day so you have to keep basic things in mind that when you do your direct and indirect i have to change person as needed i have to change tense accordingly and i have to change certain words accordingly see now i have brought it in a very simple manner in front of you you can remember these words p p t w c okay p p t w c so what's the meaning of this first of all whenever you are changing from direct to indirect remove all your punctuation mark right then you change the pronoun then you need to change the tense and then certain words specially which are denoting distance and time and you need to put even a connector or a subordinator that is that but there is an exception for this if you have an interrogative sentence or an imperative sentence you do not have to put that 
okay so it's a uh, like there is exception for this but rest of other sentences you have to use connector or subordinator that now, before going to the example, so I hope you're clear with this, like PPT, WC, punctuation, change, remove all punctuation, change your pronoun, change the tenses, change certain words, and use your coordinator, uh, sorry, connectivator or a subordinator. Now, before I take example, just I want to show you this. See how the tenses change. A, a very uh, a, a brief, uh, you can say, in a brief way, I have brought this for you because we cannot go much in detail. It's just a basic knowledge which I want to give you. So it's in front of your screen that how simple present if it is. If a sentence is in simple present, you have to change it into simple past. If it's in present continuous, change it to past continuous. Present perfect, change it into past perfect. Present perfect continuous, change it into past perfect continuous. Simple past changes to past perfect. Past continuous changes to past perfect continuous, past perfect and past perfect continuous. There is no change in the sentence. One more thing. Now see, you can see your pronouns, how the change in pronoun also occurs. Like I and we is your first person, right? You is your second person. So your first person and second person sometimes changes into third person, right? Sometimes it remains unchanged also in certain cases. You can see that how it is changing, I changing to he or she, we is changing to they, right? You is changing to he, she, they, even other are there. Like you can see into this table, me changing to him, her, us changing as them. So this is the way how your first, second and third person changes. So you need to be very sure about your first, second and third person and how you have to shift your pronouns. That also you have to be very clear about. Then here we have some words which words uh, change, okay, like now changes to then, here changes to there, hereafter, thereafter, this, that. Can you see here some today is changing to that day, tonight changing to that night, last night changing to previous night. So these are some of the words which you need to take care, particularly when you change your uh, sentence from direct into indirect. Let me bring you back now to this uh, two examples which I have for you, uh, which I have for you people. See the first uh, example that is, I never eat anything for luncheon, she said. Okay, so uh, always remember, children, that the thing which is in double inverted commas that is called as your reporting speech. Okay, and this verb, what you have, she said, so said, this is called as your reporting verb. So you need to change when you change from direct to indirect, you need to change sometimes your reporting verb according to the sentence. Like if it is interrogative, you need to change it to asked. If it is imperative, you can write it as requested, ordered. Okay, if it's an exclamatory sentence, you need to change it to, change it to exclaim. So now this, is be, this being a simple sentence, I have not changed the reporting verb. So you can see how it will go. She said, then I've used a connector. I've used the connector that she said, and can you see I've removed all the punctuation mark here. So she said that I pronoun has changed to she. So she said that she never ate anything for luncheon. Now, second example, can you cook? He asked, and again, it has one more sentence. I can cook, I lied again. So two sentences are followed one after the other, right? For two marks, they can give you two sentences also. Even one sentence also like how we have this first example. But whenever you have two sentences for your direct indirect, you have to remember that you have to connect it. Always link with some linking word. Like, see how I have changed. Now he asked. Now I told you at the beginning that uh, there should be no use of that a subordinator when you are changing an interrogative sentence. So I've not used a subordinator here. So he asked, and whenever it's a question, you have to use if or whether, okay? You have to rem remember that you have to remove that. You don't have to use that. And you have to use if or whether. So he asked if I could cook, okay? This is your first sentence. And see how it is connected. I use this particular linking word to this. 
I lied again and said that I could cook. Okay, always first priority you have to keep that check what type of sentence it is. If it's an interrogative, imperative, it's a simple sentence like declarative sentence or exclamatory sentence. And accordingly, you need to put your rules when you change from direct to indirect. Make it very simple, children. Remember your PPT, WC, okay? Remember that you have to rem remove punctuation, change pronouns, change the tense, change certain words, and use subordinator except in interrogative and imperative. Okay, now this was the end of your medium activities. Now coming to our challenging activities, uh, which again comes for two marks. And here you will get two sentences and out of two sentences, any one you have to solve. Okay, any one carrying two marks. Now you will see that what type of questions can come here in challenging activity. See, the first is use of same given word as a noun as well as a verb in sentences, two different sentences, okay? Remember that, two different sentences. Then change the degree. And next is underline the model auxiliary, state its function. Then analyze the sentence and use the given words into one meaningful sentence. So let's take all this in brief. First, let's talk about model verbs or model auxiliaries. Now, you know well that model auxiliaries, they cannot stand alone. They can't stand independently. They need some helping verbs with them, right? And uh, in front of you, you have certain model auxiliaries, which are like always like, you know, they are quite familiar or we are familiar with this, like shall, must, could, might, will, ought to, may, would, should, can. There are some more here. You can check some more. What I have missed there, like can, could, may, might, will, would, shall, should, must, ought to, used to, need, and there. So these are your important model auxiliaries. Particularly, I'll say that till must. Okay, right from can to must. These are very important. And you need to know the functions of these model auxiliaries. Right? Now, first of all, before we shift to functions, I want to tell you how it comes or how it will be placed in your question paper. So you can see this example. The first example is I dash swim in deep waters. So they can ask you fill in the blank with the auxiliary showing ability. Okay, so they can give you in this form that put some auxiliary verb, <clears throat> auxiliary verb, which shows you ability. So you should know that which are the model auxiliaries which show us ability. So this is one way how it comes. The second one is you dash be punctual. So they'll give you option, okay, two uh, or three options they may give you, particularly two options. And they'll ask you that select a correct auxiliary and place it or fill in the blank with it. So this is the second way how it can come in your activity sheet. The third one is, would you be interested in coaching the Indian women? So see how the question has come. Underline the model auxiliary and state its functions. So more chances are of this question because it comes for two marks. So they will, uh, they will want you to underline model auxiliary first and then state the function. So what are you going to do? First of all, you will highlight your model auxiliary. Okay, you will show your model auxiliary, underline it. Again, you write it down on your next line uh, or suppose if you are uh, trying to copy the state statement, after that, you write down your model auxiliary would and specify that this is the model auxiliary. And then you have to spe specify according to the sentence that what function is it playing? Now, if you see here, see what's the sentence? Would you be interested in coaching the Indian women? So see what are the functions for would? Polite request, past action, or habitual action. So here it's a polite request. So you'll need to write would and state its function saying polite request. Right? Then I dash swim in deep waters. Now two we have ability, can and could. I could swim in deep waters or I can swim in deep waters. But better grammatically what sounds is can. So I can swim in deep waters. Then you dash be punctual. So you should be punctual or you would be punctual. So certainly you should be punctual because that's uh, you know demanding obligation. Okay, it's showing compulsion. So that's why should. So these are some function in front of you children. <clears throat> that is can, ability and permission, could, 
ability, request, suggestion, permission. Me is possibility, permission, sometimes offering help, wish, might, remote possibility. I might go to uh, a fun fair, remote possibility. Then will is request and order. Would is polite request, past action, habitual action. Shall is prohibition or suggestion. Should with obligation, that is your compulsion. Probability, suggestion, condition. Must is obligation and compulsion. Ought to, obligation, probability. Used to is some past habit. Like there used to be a, a shop a few years back near my house. Okay, so past uh, existence and past habit. Uh, you can say I used to drink coffee. So past habit, the need that is necessity and dare that is courage or challenge. But more important, what you need to focus is from can to must. Okay, this is very important. Now coming to our next topic. The next topic is use the same given words as noun as well as verb in sentences. Now you know that there are certain words children which we can use only as noun. Okay, and there are certain words which we can use only as verbs. But there are some exceptional words also. We can use some words both as noun and verbs. Remember, okay? Just remember what I said. I'm just uh, repeating it. There are certain words which you can use both as noun and verbs. They function both as noun and verbs. Now, for two marks, they'll give you certain words in your activity sheet. Like, suppose I took this example, mark. Okay, and they will ask you that use the given word as noun and as verb and make two different sentences. Remember, many times children make this mistake. They make, they use the word in one sentence only. So you have to make two different sentence, sentences where in one sentence you are using it as noun and in the other sentence you are using it as verb. So see how I placed it in two different sentences? We should leave an indelible mark through our good deeds. So here you can see that mark is acting as noun. It's describing an adjective here, right? So it's very clear that it's describing, it is a noun. It's acting as a noun. Then in the second sentence, mark my words. So it's showing you action. That means it's doing the work of verb, right? So this way you have to clarify and you have to write it in two sentences where you are making the same word as noun and using the same word as verb. Now, very, very important thing and uh, the mistake which children do while they solve their paper. What they do, they change the form of the verb. So that is not, uh, you know, that's not allowed in the paper. You lose your mark in this, marks in this. Like suppose if it is mark, then you have to use the word as it is. You cannot write marking or you cannot change the form of the verb marked. Okay, you have to use same way. If it is plant, you have to use it as plant. You cannot write planting or you cannot write it as planted. Do not change the form of the verb. This is very important, which you need to remember. You have to make sentence using the same base word, okay? Now, one more very easy topic, which you can score very easily. That is use the given words into one meaningful sentence. Now, in this particular question, they will give you two different words. And these two different words, you have to use it only in one sentence. You have to remember this. See, there's a difference. In the first part, in this part, it was use the word as noun and verb in two different sentences. And here, they will give you two words and you have to use it only in one meaningful sentence. And whenever you, you are making sentences, children, remember to underline, always to highlight. Even you can see here how I have highlighted. Okay. So here, two words are given, book and table. So see how the sentence is made. My book is kept on the table. Record an office. My medical record is safely stored in the departmental office. So I have used both the words in one sentence. Here also I have used both the words in one sentence. So this is the different question. Do not mix this question with the previous one. Okay, that was different. That was making one word, making as noun and verb in two different sentences. And this is two words, making it into one meaningful sentence. 
Okay, now coming to very important topic, degrees of comparison. Now we know very well that we have three degrees of comparison, that is positive, comparative, and superlative degree, right? So here is a little table where you can be more clear that how you have to change these adjectives into different degrees, like positive, comparative, and superlative. Like see, clever, cleverer, the cleverest. Confused, more confused, the most confused. So some places you can see that how I have used ER and EST, but some places we are using more and most, okay? You can see here fascinating, more fascinating, the most fascinating. Then you can take this fast, faster, the fastest, late, later, the latest, old, older, the oldest. Okay, so this is the basic thing which you have to remember that three degrees and how you will change the word, the adjective into these three particular types that is positive, comparative and superlative. Let's take some example here. Now, what I have done, I have divided your degrees to make it in a very simple form in three types, okay? Type one, type two, and type three. Now, let us see type one. I have given the name to this type as one of the best, okay? I'm taking you to this superlative degree, this particular example I'm taking. Now, suppose if you get example where you get one of the best or one of the largest or one of the cleverest, something like that way, okay? Or one of the most beautiful, like that way, if you get. So I've taken one example. Mary Kong is one of the best boxer in India. So this comes in your type one. Can you see one of the has come? So now basic rule when you are making into positive and comparative, see, it is going to come for two marks. So they will expect you to write down uh, both to change it into positive as well as comparative. If they are giving you positive, then they will expect you to write comparative and superlative. So similarly, like you have to carry on, you have to write both the degrees. So if it is one of the best, then your basic rule is <clears throat> very few dash dash as good as. So can you see how I've started? Very few boxers in India are as good as Maricom. So this is my basic skeleton I can say. If one of the best come, then I will use this skeleton to make my positive. Okay, my positive degree. Now see, for comparative, what is the format given here? Better than, dash dash, many or most other. You can use many other or most other. See how I've changed it. Maricom is better than most other boxers in India. So can you see I have used the skeleton here, better, better than, right? Many or out of most, I have used anyone like most other. So if you remember this basic format, that if it comes in type one, I have to use this format, okay? Let's shift to type two. Now type two is the best, the best type. Like Maricom is the best boxer in India. He is the tallest boy in the class. Okay, Nagpur is the hottest city in Maharashtra. So the best. So if it falls in type two, <clears throat> then what will be the format? So for positive, no other dash dash as good as. So this will be your structure. So you should start with no other boxer in India is as good as Maricom. Okay, and comparative will be Maricom is better than any other. You have to use better than any other. So Maricom is better than any other boxer in India. Do remember, you have to remember this format. If you remember this format, that what I have to do, if it is in type one, type two, whenever you see your degrees, just place it into whether it comes in type one or it comes in type two. And once you recognize that it is coming in type two, then remember what is the format, okay? Now, what about type three? Now, type three is comparison, like Hari is taller than Sham. So comparison between Hari and Sham. Same way I've taken this example. A wise enemy is better than a foolish friend. So there's a comparison between wise enemy and foolish friend. So whenever such thing comes, it's very simple, children. Whenever you want to make positive, take the last object, like a foolish friend. 
okay take this last part and start with it so your last part will come first a foolish friend and if this is positive make it negative if it is negative make it positive only remember that much so to see how we started a foolish friend now this is positive so i'm making it negative a foolish friend is not as good as a wise enemy suppose if i say hari is taller than sham so sham is not as tall as hari okay bring the subject to object's place object to subject's place and just if it is positive make it negative if it is negative make it positive so this is the way how you have to do type 3 So whenever you see change the degree, just see whether it is type one, type two, or type three. Now, coming to the last part of uh, this particular challenging activity, okay? That is, we always, whenever we see this, we get so afraid. That is simple compound and complex sentences. Let's first of all see what is simple compound and complex sentence. Now, uh, first of all, you should be able to identify. whether it's a simple sentence whether it's a compound sentence or whether it is a complex sentence now how to identify when it's a simple sentence just remember the keywords there should be subject there should be predicate okay and there should be one finite verb very important one finite verb what is finite verb a verb that will show you action and tense okay verb that will show you action and tense and it should give you a complete meaning simple sentence take example the boys went to the park okay the boys went to the park can you see there's subject the boys predicate went to the park and there is a finite verb went which is showing you the tense right it's showing you action of going and it's also showing you the tense it's in past tense so you should quickly identify and say that this is finite uh, sorry this is simple sentence okay also simple sentence is called as an independent clause remember this now how to identify compound sentence remember the compound sentence it will have two or more independent clauses or even it's called as main clauses okay main clauses so two or more main clauses and they are always joined by coordinators so two things you have to remember here see here you have to remember subject predicate finite verb and complete meaning okay you are here you have to remember two or more than two main clauses or independent clauses and they are joined by coordinating conjunction or coordinators now uh, i have uh, made this small uh, acronym okay if you remember this acronym fan boys okay f for for a for and n for nor b for but o for or y for yet and s for so remember this acronym it's very easy fan boys okay so you have to join your compound sentence with these fan boys with these coordinating conjunctions okay these are the coordinating conjunctions so uh, you have two sentences here you can see here the boys went to the park but they did not go to the zoo okay now can you see there are two ideas shown the boys went to the park so going to the park is one idea and the second one is they did not go to the zoo and both the ideas we combined by using fan boys so you need to check that which uh, fan boys out of fan boys which suits better here like is it for or is it and or is it nor or is it but or yet so so here but suits well so that's why we placed but and made and we joined this two sentence with but in one way you can say that this is a cement fan boys okay what is the work of the cement it joins right so even here the work of coordinator is joining two or more than two independent clauses what about complex sentence now complex sentence it contains independent clause that is your main clause and one or more than one dependent clause okay and here it will always complex sentence will consist of subordinators here we had coordinators in compound sentence and here we have subordinators 
even the complex sentence joins two different sentences but it joins using your subordinators here you have some list of your subordinators you can see after before because although when since if whenever unless so depending upon the sentence if it, if the sentence is showing you time then you can use after or when if it is showing you place you can use where wherever if it's showing you reason you can use because so these subordinating conjunctions if you fix in your mind it will be very easy to identify that this is a complex sentence now i have brought one example and same example i have converted into simple compound and complex okay transformation of sentences now see the first sentence here uh, the first sentence is hearing the shots the boy woke up okay now uh, you will have one uh, i just now i told you that in simple sentence we have only one finite verb but you may say that here we have hearing this also is verb and this also woke is verb but let me tell you that hearing is not verb okay it's not acting as a verb it's a gerund okay it looks like verb but it is not verb it is acting as a gerund okay it's doing the work of noun so that is why if you check in the sentence you will get one subject the boy okay then you will get predicate that is hearing the shots woke up the further part of the sentence and one finite verb that is woke it is showing you action and it is showing you tense so this is very clear that this is a simple sentence and uh, if you want to go in more detail about how to make simple sentence i will just tell you in brief that you can make simple sentence either by putting participles okay like present participle or past participle then you can make simple sentence by putting your infinitives you can make simple sentence by putting a gerund of uh, with preposition okay then you can make your simple sentence by putting an adjective by putting an adverb there are many ways to make simple sentence but whenever you make a simple sentence you have to keep three four things in your mind subject <clears throat> predicate finite verb and it's giving you a complete meaning right now see the same sentence how i changed it into compound now uh first of all divide the sentence into two ideas what are what is the first idea hearing the shot and the second idea is the boy woke up two ideas okay now both the both these two ideas we have to combine it we have to cement it up and how we have to cement it up do you remember compound words i told you fan boys okay so remember these fan boys which we saw just now so two different ideas we are going to combine with fan boys so now what i can use so see how i i can do like uh, this way the boy heard the shots and he woke up two ideas and i combined it with my one of the fan boys called as and that is my coordinator okay so you can see how simple it is to change from simple to compound just split it in two different ideas and combine it okay with a coordinator or join it with a coordinator now same sentence i'm making it making it into complex now when i make it into a complex i have to see that i have to use a subordinator right so now here uh, the same sentence see i can write i can use so many subordinators here like the boy wake, wake woke up when he heard the shots or the boy woke up because he heard the shots or i can say as soon as the boy heard the shots he woke up or even i can say the boy woke up after he heard the shots so can you see so many subordinators i could use here and it's not restricted that you use you use only when here or you use because if it's not changing your meaning the meaning of the sentence then it is exactly correct okay so remember this very simple thing simple compound and complex when you want to make compound two different sentences two ideas join it with fan boys okay and when you are making a complex sentence then you have to see that you have to join your two different ideas with a subordinating clause using the subordinators so one example is kept for you here you can try it out driving home he stepped to drink tea 
So two ideas are there. So this is very clear that it's it's a simple sentence, right? Now, how it's going to come in exam? See, in exam, they can ask you to convert it into any one. First of all, they can ask you that identify whether this is simple, compound, or complex. Okay, so you need to identify it, and then they may ask you that convert it into a complex sentence, convert it into compound sentence, right? Or they can directly ask you that change or analyze uh, the sentence, or uh, you can say, uh, uh, change it into complex sentence or compound sentence directly. So there are a number of ways how uh, the person who's going to set your paper can put this question in your activity sheet. So this is the way that how you have to change or how you have to transform your sentences. I hope that with this, you may be feeling that now at least we can identify that how or which sentence is simple sentence, which sentence is compound sentence, and which sentence is complex sentence, okay? Just ending with uh, a very beautiful tip for you. Uh, now, uh, you being in 10th standard, it's very difficult for you to spare your time. And every time you might be telling to your parents and to people around you that I have no time. Okay, I'm so busy completing my notes and completing do doing this, studying that. So for you, a small tip. If you want to become successful, then you have to apply this tip. You will never find time. You have to make time. Okay, this is your takeaway tip for today. So best of luck, all the students, and God bless all of you. Thank you so much. I'm just coming back. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, it was a wonderful session. Thank students, you, ma'am. Uh, students, you have any questions? At least regarding the first uh, language study part, if you if you have some doubts, you can ask. Yeah, there are uh, some users, uh, maybe students on YouTube, who are mm -hmm. asking for repeating the explanation of complex. Complex sentence. Yes. Okay. So should I go back? If we have time. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, sir, is it visible? Yes, yes. Yeah. One minute. Okay. Uh, so regarding complex sentence, I'll just explain it again. That do remember that complex sentence, how to identify a complex sentence is very easy. Whenever you see these subordinators, okay, after, before, because, although, when, since, if, whenever, unless, while, so that, even though, wherever. See, in our next coming session, uh, we are going to, even when uh, your scene passages, we, we are going to deal. So that time, uh, you will be having an idea about noun clauses, adverb clauses, and adjective clauses, about clauses, okay? So remember that complex sentence always reflects clauses. Okay, it's very close to clauses. So you will find that all these words which are here, most of the words, these all subordinators, they are part of your adverb clauses. So whenever you see these subordinators, that is after, before, because, although, when, since, you should suddenly, or you, it should stuck in your mind that these are complex sentences. Okay, and you have to remember that it will contain one main clause, and more than one or two, you can say dependent clauses. And it is joined by a subordinator. Okay, like I took this example. See, for making complex sentence, how I wrote it. This is the formula. That is one independent clause, one or more subordinate clause. Okay, and this subordinate clause should start with your subordinator. Okay, so can you see, see the boy woke up. This is your one main clause. Okay, one independent clause. Then we are taking the second part, your second uh, subordinate clause. This is your subordinate clause. And we are joining it with a subordinator. 
So I can use your when, I can use your because, I can use as soon as, I can use after. Always my subordinating clause starts with a subordinator. Okay, and then continue the sentence. So when he heard the shots, the boy woke up. You use a subordinator when he heard the shots. So when you are changing from compound to complex, or when you're changing from simple to complex, remember that there should be one main clause and one or more than one subordinate clause. And my subordinate clause has to start with a subordinator. Okay. Yeah, sir, anything else? Ma'am, anything else? Uh, nothing. They were asking the difference between compound and complex sentences. Yeah, and just now we... Hmm. Yeah, the main difference between compound and complex sentences, like difference between, uh, like, you know, how you need to identify it, that is with a coordinator and a subordinator. See, compound sentences just joining two main clauses. There are two main clauses and you are joining it with a coordinator. Okay. And when you take a complex sentence, there are not that it's it doesn't only have a main clause. It has a main clause, it has a subordinate clause, which is joined with a subordinator. So this is the main difference between a compound and a complex sentence. Yeah. They also want to know the difference between transitive verb. Uh, transitive and intransitive verb? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, I, I'll, I'll just uh, tell about transitive verbs. See, a uh, transitive verb, first of all, whenever action passes from subject to object, okay, action passes from subject to object. Like, take one simple example. The birds fly in the sky. Birds are your subject and they are flying and this action of flying is getting passed to the sky. So whenever your action passes from subject to object, we call it as a transitive verb. And suppose if your action doesn't pass from subject to object, like if I take the same sentence and if I say uh, the birds fly, okay? So the birds fly, you have a subject and you have a verb. So action of flying is not passed to any object. So that's why at this particular moment, I will say that here the verb is intransitive. So very simple to remember that if your verb, uh, sorry, if the action of the verb is passing from subject to object, it is transitive verb, okay? And if the action of the verb is not passing from subject to object, then it is intransitive verb. Then there's a question, how a word can be used as a noun and a verb? Uh, yeah, we already took that yeah. part. Yeah, actually we finished with that part. Yeah. Only thing you have to remember is, like see, it's a, a very simple trick I would like to give you. Whenever you are making any word, uh, like uh, when you are changing that particular word and uh, applying it in your sentence uh, where it, it will reflect or it will show the function of noun, uh, try to see, uh, try to use that particular word either in subject place or object place. So it will show you clearly that yeah, it's doing the work of noun. Or, or you know, before that word, you use some adjective. So you will be very clear that yeah, some uh, it, it's doing the work of noun. Like uh, uh, you can say a dancing doll. Okay, so uh, suppose if the word was like doll. Okay, like that way, just I'm telling you that way. Like we took some example, we had plant, we had value in our, when I was teaching about that. So plant is there. So I have a green plant or I have a, uh, you can say I have a, a, a beautiful garden having many plants or I can say I have a green plant at my home or I have a plant. Yeah, I have a green plant at my home. So that will show that, okay, it's doing the work of noun. And suppose if I say plant a neem tree. So now here it's doing the work of an action. So that means it will show clearly that it is doing the work of verb, right? Uh, one question is, is that in degrees of comparison positive, in, in the positive degree, are we supposed to use as dot dot as, so what are the indicators of, uh, of the degrees of comparison. Uh, let me, I think I should take back to the screen. 
one minute. Yeah. Is it visible, ma'am? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, this is the place, right? Uh, so the question was, ma'am, can you just repeat it? Uh, which words are the indicators of uh, the degree, like for positive? Are they supposed to use as, dot, dot, as? Yes, yes. That's what I have written. See, it's, that's why I brought you to the screen. Can you see that as, dash, dash, as? And I think I... Rashashvi, Ra, uh, Rajeshwari Shukla is, the, it, uh, uh, is satisfied with that answer. Okay, yeah, because see, I have differentiated into type one and type two, which will clearly tell you that which are, th that's why I told, I used the word skeleton here. Okay, so this is your basic skeleton. Okay, a format that if you are in type one, if you have a type one sentence, use this particular format. Very few and in further part of the sentence as dash dash as. And if you are in type two, then the indicator is or the format is no other dash dash as dash dash as so like this way so that's why i brought this uh, i brought you back to the screen to show you that these are the things basic things basic you know format which you have to use i that's why i use the word skeleton use the skeleton and just fill in the blank thank okay. you so much ma'am uh, renu ma'am yes yeah shall we move to the vote of thanks yes sir yes please uh, so i request aditi shah to propose the vote of thanks. I request Aditi. Miss Aditi Shah. Aditi, you need to unmute yourself. Good evening, yes. everyone. On the behalf of the members of MNET, I would like to thank Mrs. Renita Augustine for volunteering her time and providing us with such an informative and engaging presentation on the topic of language study. The topic explained by her was of immense help for the students. The message towards the end of your slide was also quite apt. I would also want to appreciate the constant efforts of Mr. Nadeem Khan for providing the necessary technical support to the MNET team. I would uh, also like to thank um, uh, the host and convener, Mrs. Renu Dhotre, for organizing the series of workshops through the platform of MNET. These workshops have enabled the teachers to stay updated with the latest methods and tools in varied areas of teaching, which can be utilized by them in the classroom as well as for online teaching purposes. I would like to extend a thanks to the participants from various countries for effectively participating. Um, the spread of the number of students and um, teachers which we are reaching out through these workshops has been increasing with every passing workshop. We at MNET appreciate the positive feedback obtained from all the participants and look forward to such enthusiasm from our participants in the future as well. Once again, a huge thanks to everyone and have a great evening.